All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Thursday's edition of Faith and Healing School. We are glad you guys are joining us uh, live stream and also you guys in person. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn this morning over to 2 Kings um, chapter 5. And while you guys are doing that, we'll pray. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word. Father, we thank you that as your anointed word goes forth, it never returns void. It will always produce in the lives that hear the word, receive the word, and apply the word to their lives. And we thank you for that. We ask you that, we, that you give us nuggets of truth that we can apply to our lives today, Father. And as we join our faith together and believe you for revelation knowledge, you will not disappoint us, Father. And we thank you. We thank you for that. We thank you that a revelation is progressive, Father, that we have a spirit, a teachable spirit this morning, that if we look into Scripture and say, hey, you know, we may have heard this before, that's something we're not endeavoring to do because we know you want to give us more light, that you want to open the eyes of our understanding to the truth of your word, Father. And we thank you for it, and we hope that everything and believe that everything is said and done today will bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So before we get started, I just want to make a quick announcement uh, for the, you, those you, of you guys who are signed up for um, our voicemail message and our text messaging service. I threw out a message this morning that mentioned um, we were doing live stream a Brother Keith Moore's Greater Faith Conference here at the church uh, for the last three nights at 7 p.m. And we have decided to continue to do that for the last two nights. Um, it's a blessing. You know, if you've been coming, we're going to continue it tonight at 7 p.m. and tomorrow night at 7 p.m. as well. So come on out. If you haven't come, doesn't matter. Plug in. You know, Brother Keith always does a little bit of a review. So, um, you know, come on out if, it's, if you haven't missed any of the other nights. The other three are starting to become available on their website, which is Faith Life Church, Sarasota. I looked this morning, I think only the first night was available, but I'm sure they'll be updating that. But come out tonight at 7 p.m. for the women that normally come out for the Abundant Grace Church outreach. If you're watching uh, via live stream this morning or in here, uh, just a reminder, that's gonna replace, so that's gonna replace the women's outreach, which normally happens at six. So come out at seven instead of six, and that will be the women's outreach. And like I said, again, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Also, we're going to be receiving offerings for the Greater Faith Conference. So if you're not comfortable with texting directly to Faith Life Church, uh, we'll receive an offering here, and we will send them a check if you're playing by uh, check or uh, cash or credit card. If you're paying, if you want to give your offering by check, you can actually make that out to Faith Life International yourself, and we will make sure it gets down to Florida. So glory to God. So I told you guys to turn over to 2 Kings chapter 5. So kind of on the heels of we were taught what we were talking about the last time I was with you guys, and we were specifically speaking about um, God's Word as a medicine. And there's a number of schools thought out there inside the body of Christ that are false, erroneous, as to, um, as to where healing is concerned. For example, there's a number of believers that actually believe that healing was done away with when the, the, the elders, which included the apostles, you know, the original 12 that were left in the first century, the apostle Paul, when, when those in that time of ministry had went home to be with the Lord, people believe that healing is no longer relevant. It doesn't exist anymore. And that's false. You know, we see many examples in the book of Acts where healing was being done by the believers, right? And the reality is we are still today living in the book of Acts. The church age has not come to a close. So Acts has 28 chapters. We're really living in Acts chapter 29. It's still continuing. And then the second school of thought that it's God's will to heal only if it's his specific will for you. Meaning, Joe gets healed, John doesn't get healed because it wasn't God's will to heal John. Again, that thinking is false. That type of thinking makes God a respecter of persons. And God is no respecter of persons. So that would make the word of God a lie. 
right? If God became a respecter of persons, that means God is a liar. And we have scripture to say, God is not a man that would lie. So we have to settle it once and for all that healing is for everyone and that healing is for today. And, you know, so often, and we should we spend much of our time in the New Testament, right? And the gospel accounts are full, gospel accounts, good news, which is really all the, all the word of God, but the gospels themselves, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are filled with numerous examples. And again, sometimes they're repeated examples from the, from the different authors of the books, same experience with the same manifestation of healing. But Jesus' whole ministry was about preaching the repentance, the kingdom of God, and facilitating healing. Healing all those who were sick and oppressed by the devil. That was Jesus' ministry. So people say, yeah, well, we see Jesus healing. But we forget often to look back to the Old Testament because God's been in the healing business since day one. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit, probably today and tomorrow. I want us to look at several instances, both the Old and New Testament, where healing was manifested and avoid some of the pitfalls that some of the people um, almost, you know, did that almost to the point where they missed their healing. So I told you to turn over to 2 Kings chapter 5. And this should be a familiar story if you spend any time in the Old Testament. It's actually one of my favorite Old Testament Bible stories um, because of the healing that was facilitated here. But there was an opportunity inside this healing story where the person being healed absolutely almost missed it. You know, when I, when I put this in the context of us looking at the Greater Faith Conference and give you guys a little tidbit that I haven't been watching, um, really, Brother Keith has been talking about submission, humility, how, how, how humble Jesus was as our shining example of humility, right? And why do I say that? Because God institutes healing in many different ways, right? And we have a part to play in it. You know, when we look at a New Testament story that we're going to maybe get to today, I don't know, but definitely tomorrow, we see God manifesting healing on his own without somebody praying about it, without it, somebody even believing, necessarily believing for it, just instituted it on his own, which he did a lot of in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament. God can facilitate and manifest healing any way he wants. But in all those instances, we have a part to play in receiving it. And humility is a key part to our walk and receiving from God right? And this is the story of Naaman, right? And let's start reading in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the kings of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Let's stop there for a second. Naaman had a lot of things in the natural going for him. A lot of things that, look, you could be physically inside the military, and you could be a commander in the military whereby you have a rank like Naaman had, right? And anytime we have like job titles and ranks and we're known for doing things, we have some sort of fame, for lack of a better term, it's an opportunity to puff ourselves up in pride, right? An opportunity for our egos to grow. The reality is, I, I forget who I picked this up from. I don't know if it was a secular book or a teaching in the church, but when we see the word, or we think of an ego, right? Somebody's ego. What does that stand for when we think about it from a spiritual perspective? It stands for edging God out. 
I can do it myself because I'm this great person. Look at me, look at all the accol accolades I've accumulated, look at all my trophies, look at all my medals, look at all the designations after my name. And we can have a tendency to get puffed up by some sort of status that we society, right? Now, Naaman was a mighty man of valor. It goes on to tell us in the rest of, uh, of verse one, he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. So we have this guy, significant in the eyes of his master, meaning the king, and mighty man of value, great warrior, you know, known for doing great on the battlefield, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids, and he brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. So Naaman's dealing with leprosy. It just it is what it is. And if you know anything about leprosy, you know, and I, thank God and glory to God, we don't deal with that much anymore. You know, it's 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 still around in some, you know, third world type uh, countries. But it was no joke. It was a skin infection and deterioration that literally caused limbs to fall off. And by the and you were actually considered unclean. You couldn't even be among the people. So leprosy was not a good thing, although Naaman was not a Jew. Okay. So he, they captured this young girl who, were, who waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Let's stop there for a second. This girl, captive, Think about this for a second. This girl who was Naaman's captive, his servant, somebody he had conquered in battle and now had won over to him, right? The reality is she had heard something. She had heard something about the prophet. Well, how often do we come to the saving knowledge of Christ, of healing in our bodies. In this case, Jesus wasn't on the scene yet, right? Jesus was prophesied about by Isaiah, the, 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 the Savior to come, the healer to come, but Jesus isn't on the scene. But yet this woman still heard about the prophet doing some stuff. So first and foremost, we need to hear, right? We need to hear for ourselves. If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of this leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. So Naaman listened to what the, his servant heard. The only reason I bring, well, not the only reason, but the reason I bring this up is we're going to see that Naaman had a bout of pride raise up in him that almost caused his healing not to manifest. But when I, when I see this, I do believe that deep down on the inside, there was some humility at work in him. Maybe not on the surface. Maybe it was something that he had buried deep down inside because for him to listen to his servant and take her advice means he humbled himself a little bit and listened. And there's another example we're going to see of this in a second. So Naaman takes the advice of his servant and goes to see the king and tells him about the story that the servant had told him about the prophet in the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he gets the king's blessing, and he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, Naaman my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. Verse 7. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am I God? 
to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So the king takes his letter in a bad way. He's thinking that they're looking to pick a fight with him because this is something he can't do. So again, the healing almost gets stopped there, but glory to God, Elijah had heard about what had happened. So that's where he was really who we needed to obviously get to. So verse eight, so it was when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman takes off, right? Okay, I'm gonna go see Elisha. That's where, I'm, where I need to be anyway. So verse nine goes on, then with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. This is where it starts to get funky for Naaman where he almost misses it, right? Now think about this for a second. He's got horses, he's got a chariot, mighty man of valor, right? To have a chariot in those days, and the type of chariot I'm sure that Naaman had was adorned with battle gear and you know decked out, and here I come, the mighty man of valor, right? And he gets to Eliza's house, and verse 10, here's what happens. Now, Elijah knows he's coming, and Elijah knows the problem, and Elijah knows we could take care of this for this guy, right? And Elijah sent a message to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Simple instructions to follow to manifest healing. If somebody who wasn't dealing with a level of pride in their life received those instructions from the prophet's servant, right? Simple. Wow, good stuff. I'm going to go down to the Jordan. I'm going to dip seven times, and my leprosy is going to be gone. But that's not where Naaman's head was. It wasn't where his heart was. What happened to him? He became furious. Was he furious at necessarily the plan that Elijah gave him to manifest the healing? Or was he furious just for the fact that Elijah sent his servant and Elijah didn't come to him personally, the mighty man of valor? Personally, I think it's part two because Elijah didn't come to him personally, the mighty man of valor. And Naaman got offended. What does offense do? Offense makes a snap decision based on the offense. A decision that's made out of anger, pride, fear, so offense makes a snap decision and pride stops us from coming back and rectifying it. Which is almost what happened here. Naaman became furious, went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, because he had it all figured out, right? Naaman had a plan how Elijah was going to manifest this healing for him he had it figured out himself that this is the way it's going to happen. God's going to, through Elijah, do a specific thing. Well, that in itself is pride. When we try to take control and figure out how God's going to do it, that's our own pride rising up in us and telling us, I got this. I don't need God. I have the plan. So God, fit your plan into my box. We can't do that. God's ways are not our ways. He doesn't think like we think. Every time when I look back on my life, when I think about how I thought God was going to manifest something in my life, it wasn't even close. It was above and beyond ever I could, whatever I could think of or imagine or believe, right? So Naaman gets furious, and he says, 
But Naaman and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Verse 12, are not the Abana and the Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away in a rage. Stop there for a second. He gets mad for a lot of reasons. He gets mad because he hasn't figured out for himself how Elijah is going to facilitate this. He gets angry because Elijah sent a servant instead of coming out to him himself. Right where a humble heart would say, I don't care. I don't care how this gets done. I just know it's going to get done because guess what? It's a simple plan. Then he gets furious because he thinks the Jordan River is dirtier than the rivers in Damascus. I'd rather dip in my own. That's not what God had told him to do, right? And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So we see another start. Again, the little tidbit for me of the fact that there may have been underlying humility in Naaman's life was when he took the advice of his captured servant girl and said, I, she's here, heard about this prophet. Maybe I should do something about that. Now we see him with his, his men that are under him, right, that he has authority over giving him advice and speaking to him of what to do. And, there, and, it, and he decides to, yeah, you guys are probably right. You know, I should really do what he says. That shows us a couple things, right? That he's starting to become more humble. And it's, it's a great piece of advice for us because if you're in leadership in any area, in the church, in your business world, at your job, whatever, that we should never not look to take advice, get opinions, you know, when it comes to decision make, decision making, or consult with those under you. You know, those under you. You know, my, my endeavor has pretty much the majority of my career, both in ministry and in business, to surround, my surround myself with people that are smarter than I am. But if you, you have people that you work for you or work under you that are smarter than you. That's a good thing. What does that mean? You should heed their advice, right? You should heed their advice. Take it into consideration. Doesn't mean you have to act on it, but humility says, they may be subordinate to me, but I need to really turn an ear towards listening, right? So Naaman starts to change his heart a little bit. And he go, after he goes on his rant, his servants tell him, hey, look, if Elijah did something great, would you have not done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So Naaman went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, and according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like a flesh of a little child, and he was clean. What a shock. God spoke to Elijah. Elijah, through Gehazi, a servant, spoke to Naaman, and guess what was facilitated? Healing in his body. Exactly what the desired outcome would be. But it came with a necessity for Naaman to turn to a humble heart so that he could receive, to not try to figure out how God was going to institute it, how God was going to make it happen through Elijah, to just be willing and obedient to obey what the servant said. And that took a couple steps along the way. God placed people in Naaman's past that could get the point across to him. And we know that we know what happened. The healing was facilitated. I love the way the word of God says the flesh of a the flesh was as of a little child. New. Right? Pure. 
But what kind of faith do we need? We need the faith as of a little child. What do little children do till they get to that age where they can, they don't say, they can say no, right? Before that, you ask them to do something or you tell them we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And what do they do? They simply believe, right? That's what we need to do. Now, there's something else I wanted to bring up here. We, the healing's manifested. 15, and I want to look at something else in here that we want to be, be cognizant of. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before, before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, this is Elijah, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Why is that important? You never have to pay for your healing. You know, that's why you guys know my heart, and I minister along these lines often, that we have to be so careful about what we let in, what we watch, what we hear. Right? Because if it's not the word of God, then it's nothing. It's literally useless. It can't even be partly the word and partly true. Because who did that? Whose characteristic is that? The devil's. The devil did that to Jesus after Jesus came out of the wilderness experience and the devil came to tempt him. That was partly true and part distortion. Right? So that means if it's partly true and part distortion, the part dis distortion trumps the truth, which means it's all wrong, right? You will watch, I, I guarantee you, because I've seen it for myself, on Christian television, we got to be careful, right? Maybe somebody's book, an article, whatever, that says something along the lines of, you know, if you sow an offering, you're going to receive your healing. Can we look to scripture right here where Elijah said, you're not paying for your healing? Quite honestly, without me for the sake of time, going on to read what happens is Elijah's servant, Gehazi, says, well, wait a second. I'll take it. Goes and pursues Naaman, gets a gift from, it, from, from Naaman, and winds up with what? Naaman's leprosy because of it. He opened the door to the enemy to be like, here you go. Right? No, you don't ever have to pay for your healing. Why? It was a free gift of God by grace as God's plan of redemption. You know, I just alluded to Isaiah, you know, prophet, Savior to come. Well, what does that mean? Isaiah 53 says that by Jesus' stripes, you're healed. Did you pay for your salvation? Well, glory to God. No, it was a free gift. Guess what? So's healing. Those two things were accomplished on the way to the cross and on the cross. Healing is So I thought that was just a little extra I wanted to bring up. But what I kind of wanted to close down with today is, you know, like I said, we spend so often a lot of time in the New Testament looking to Jesus' healing ministry. And we should, because that's for today. Not only is it for today, the Gospels give us, as believers, instructions that we can do the same things that Jesus did here on the earth, but not only the same things, greater things than these shall we see. Glory to God, that's good news that we can help facilitate healing in the lives of people, right? And when we know healing is the dinner bell to what? salvation, which is fulfillment of our great commission, which is to go and take the gospel to the lost and dying world, right? So based on our story here with Naaman, what do we need to conclude? That we need to have a humble heart to really receive anything from God. Amen? Amen. But what I wanted to look at is, you know, again, often we, we look to the New Testament, like I said, but we don't look to the Old Testament where healing was instituted in a number of ways. And I just want to for this, just go through some of these scriptures pretty, pretty quickly, where we can see it clear and as plain as day, right? 
Genesis chapter 20, verse 17 and 18, I'm reading this out of the uh, English Standard Version, says this, that Abraham prayed to God. This is, a, this is, this is a, a manifestation of healing through prayer alone, but a healing. God was still in the healing business at the beginning, or was in the healing business. It wasn't just after Jesus came on the scene. Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, right? And also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. We know what happened there. There was kind of like a half-truth told by Abraham, which kind of left this curse hanging out there on Abimelech's household. And what happened? Abraham, after he realized what had happened, and the king confronted him, like, why didn't you just tell us who she really was? And so you, all this didn't happen. What happened? Long and the short of, short of it is, Abraham prayed, and healing was manifested. Amen? How about Rachel? Jacob's wife, Rachel. Couldn't conceive children. Not being able to conceive. Can we say that to, to conceive, if you're not able to conceive, that you need healing? Something needs to change in your body to manifest being able to now give birth versus not being able to give birth. So what happened? God remembered Rachel, and God, God listened to her and opened her womb. That's Genesis chapter 30, verse 22. Rachel, again, prayed herself, and healing was manifested in her body. Another example, Numbers chapter 12, verse 13, again out of the English Standard Version, is a story of Moses. What happened? Why, did, why was there healing necessity that Moses needed to pray for? Well, he needed to pray for his sister, Miriam, because she had questioned Moses' leadership, and that questioning of Moses' leadership and her brother as well did the same thing. Um, and it opened the door for her herself to become a leper. She wound up a leper. And Moses himself, in Numbers chapter 12, verse 13, prayed, and Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her, please. The reality was that prayer did manifest an instantaneous healing for Miriam. She was actually told that she needed to return to the leper camp outside of Israel for seven days, and then after the seventh day, her healing of leprosy manifested. So we see that God can institute healing through prayer, right? Can he institute healing through the laying on of hands? What does that require? Faith and action, right? Faith from a couple different perspectives. Faith from the perspective of the person that's coming for healing to believe that healing belongs to them. You know, one of the things that I've always endeavored, I shouldn't say always endeavored, I've endeavored for the last, you know, period of time for a while to find out where people are at. I don't just blanketly pray. If somebody says, I've come, to, I, I want you to pray and lay hands on me for healing. Okay, well, we need to find out where they're at. Do you believe that by Jesus' stripes you're healed? Are you sold out to the idea that healing is for you? That he himself, meaning Jesus, bore and took your infirmities to the cross? And if you get an answer like, I think so, we're not praying. We're going to do what? We're going to sit down and we're going to talk about it a little bit for. We have to resign in our hearts that we know that we know that healing is for us. Because what happens? That person does not have the faith to receive the manifestation of their healing. They're wishing and a hope in the world's way, not the God's kind of hope, which is a confident expectation in the fact that God is faithful to watch over his word and perform it, right? So we're going to go a little bit further. We're going to talk. We're going to teach. Then the faith has to be the one who's laying hands on you. It's a, we join our faith together in agreement. There's power in agreement. Now, if we're both in agreement, then we're going to pray. 
if there's only one of us agreeing with, now keep in mind, what are we agreeing with? Each other and the word. And if one of us doesn't, is wavering on the word, there can be no agreement. That's why it's so very important to be careful who lays hands on you. There's ministries right now, like hospital ministries, and thank God for them, that they're praying for people in hospitals that are in all kinds of conditions. They'll come in and pray, maybe lay hands on them, whatever, and then leave the room and turn around and say, this doesn't look good. That's not good, right? That's not good. I want anybody that lays hands on me to know that they know that they know that healing or whatever we're believing God for is ours, already ours. You have to be careful who lays hands on you. So God can institute healing on his own. He can institute healing through prayer. He can institute healing through the laying on of hands. He can institute healing where you just you and God get in agreement with the word and it manifests in your body, right? There's so many ways that God can institute healing. And it's different. It's personal for everyone. And it may be different at different times in your life too. Maybe you had an experience where you had somebody laid hands on you. Maybe where something else came along and you got in the word of God and you saw what was yours and you just sat in scripture and meditate on God's healing power and it manifested, right? God can do it a bunch of different ways. But to close with the fact, it was God was in the healing business from the beginning and he's still in the healing business. And tomorrow we're gonna get into some New Testament scripture and New Testament ground where we see some other things happening. Some of them talking about humility, some places where maybe somebody almost missed it. And just, just really kind of reinforce our faith in the area that healing is for today. It's for us. It's for right now. But it depends on us. We have a part to play in it. Amen? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We thank you for our time together. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that it's alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. To the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, pointing us in a direction that we need to change, Lord. And we thank you for it. We thank you that healing belongs to us, that God's word is medicine, Lord. And as we take a daily dose of it, multiple doses of it, it will work in our lives, Father. And that as we go deeper and have greater revelation of what's ours in Christ, we will see everything we're believing God for. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So glory to God, we love you guys. Come back for tomorrow. We're gonna look at part two of this. Don't forget about tonight's live stream, um, 7 p.m., Greater Faith Conference. Ladies, your outreach, switch from six to seven. Live stream will be your outreach. So glory to God, we love you guys. We'll see you 